Das ist steht aufschießen. Lüftung klar, Windung klar, Vorstufe klar. Exploring the great minds of our forefathers. Building a grand vision for our children. This is Navigator. Good evening uh, from my side in Budapest, uh, Dr. Giorgiani. It's a pleasure and an honor to meet you here. Arctos for the occasion of the uh, winter edition. Today's edition has given us permission to uh, make a, a, a writer's conference. So two writers for Arctos who can interview each other. In this case, it's me interviewing uh, Dr. Giorgiani, well-known uh, former uh, editor-in-chief of Arctos and uh, foremost writer, I would say, uh, many of whose books have been published through Arctos. Uh, what we are going to do here is uh, uh, not a book review in the standard way, but uh, contextual interpretation, because um, Mr. Tardini, Dr. Tardini has been talking about his book extensively uh, on um, other interviews. Uh, the content has been uh, quite high quality in some of them I've seen. Um, I would like to refer to them. They have been posted, as I've seen today, uh, on his personal website. I think it's called Jason Reza Tardini. Is that correct? Yes, jasonrezagiorgiani.com. And it's right. a pleasure to be with you, Alexander. Thank you very much. So um, I think it's important for uh, our listeners uh, who are interested in the actual content of his book uh, to delve into these interviews, which are freely available uh, through uh, Dr. Giordani's private website. And it's up to me to set the tone, of course, here, because this interview will be uh, dealing with a very particular topic at a very particular time. Um, I was uh, in doubt whether to call this Wonderland or uh, the Nightmare Before Christmas. I think the, the second uh, is appropriate uh, to the way Dr. Giorgini has treated his subject uh, in his book. It's the subject of UFOs. And this topic, of course, uh, the way he treats it for sure, is uh, quite scary, quite unsettling, quite alienating in ways. Um, but uh, Dr. Giordani approaches the topic in an entirely different way uh, than the people that I've been uh, used dealing with, which are traditionalist writers. Traditionalist writers uh, tend to recognize the phenomenon of uh, the UFO and take it very seriously, but um, also uh, look at the joyous aspect of it. We'll come back to that later. Uh, what I will do for now is set the tone by uh, quoting uh, from Dr. Giordani's book, uh, the first uh, page, in fact. So that sets the tone very quite well. Um, he uses a, a quotation by um, somebody, a literary figure, American literary figure, very popular with the dissident right. For to all intents and purposes, uh, we belong both to that group in some ways. So the quote is as follows. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little. But someday the piercing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein that we, may, that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Um, after having read uh, your work, Dr. Giorgiani, I think this is a very appropriate uh, quotation. Um, it covers not only the content, but also uh, the conclusion quite well, which is quite dark in many ways. This is the first uh, setting I wanted to use. And the uh, second setting is the timing of your book. And that's my first question to you. Um, the timing of your book, I think, is highly appropriate because uh, it comes actually right after uh, the first serious uh, UAP or UFO disclosure by the American government itself. Um, we can, from a traditionalist point of view, we could speak about uh, synchronicity here. Um, was it your intent uh, to have this book published 
uh, exactly at this time, or is there another uh, factor at working? So first of all, let me just say, I apologize to the listeners if I'm a bit distracted. There's a massive construction outside the window here, such as life in Manhattan. Uh, hopefully the, um, the microphone will cancel it on your end. Uh, so in answer to your question, Alexander, yes, um, I had planned to engage in my most extensive discussion of UFOs in a way that was timed with something like this disclosure. Uh, so this is a book that I've had in the back of my mind for about 20 years now. I've seriously researched UFOs going back two decades. And those who followed my writings know that uh, toward the end of Prometheus and Atlas, I broached this subject in the context of parapsychology, because as we'll discuss, there is a significant intersection between ufology and parapsychology. And there were uh, theorists such as uh, Carl Jung, and then later John Keel and Jacques Vallée that believed um, that there were significant parapsychological dimensions to the UFO phenomenon. So in the context of my uh, philosophical treatment of parapsychology in Prometheus and Atlas, I had uh, delved into the subject of UFOs. Uh, and then my book, Novel Folklore, which nominally is an exegesis of the Persian novella, The Blind Owl by Sadaq Hadayat, included a comparison um, of the blind owl with Whitley Strieber's communion. So that was another context in which, uh, you know, I dipped into the UFO subject. But I have uh, extensively and substantively researched this phenomenon for at least two decades now. Um, and so when I got down to writing this book, uh, despite the fact that it's a pretty hefty volume, I wrote it uh, rather rapidly. Um, because I knew already, you know, what the thesis was going to be. And really, I was just waiting for this historical moment, which I knew would come at some point. Um, and so, you know, when we got the signal, uh, somewhere between, let's say, 2018 and 2019, that this kind of disclosure was uh, headed our way, uh, I began to, you know, more... Um, rigorously formulate these ideas. And then, uh, you know, once the UAP report was actually commissioned or rather mandated by the director of national intelligence, Radcliffe, uh, at the end of the Trump administration, I really set about uh, writing this work. And so, you know, in short, the answer to your question is yes, it's a book I had in the back of my mind for a long time. And so I was ready at the uh, appropriate moment to, uh, you know, put it in writing. Yes, um, what I understood from uh, your book is that you consider this uh, putative UAP disclosure as an elaborate psyop uh, enforced uh, on the authorities, but nevertheless uh, psyop. Um, I find it very uh, interesting to see that uh, this disclosure comes hard on the heels of uh, the triple coup, I call it, uh, so the corona, the BLM, and uh, the Biden uh, so called election. Um, very shortly thereafter, uh, we are falling in this uh, UAP story. It is, um, uh, it makes sense uh, that it takes place now. But you also have pointed to um, a larger background uh, that is not merely uh, political in nature, but uh, that has to do with um, an agenda that's enforced upon uh, the regime, let's say, uh, the ruling class. Um, it is important, I think, that I uh, give a little bit uh, background for the people who have not read your book. So, uh, Dr. Jordani's book is divided into uh, seven uh, chapters, which actually are uh, almost to be read as independent essays. The sixth chapter could actually book be a book in its, on its, in its own right. The first deals with the uh, UAP from a standpoint of uh, sovereignty, as understood through the lens of uh, uh, the legal philosophy of uh, Carl Schmitt. So, uh, what would be uh, the challenge to uh, sovereignty, earthly authority, uh, earthly sovereignty, if the UAP uh, phenomenon takes center stage uh, in current affairs. Um, the second uh, chapter 
and uh, it's involved with the third and the fourth kind uh, encounters that are not covered by the UAP disclosure by the authorities. The third is uh, the central thesis, the first great central thesis of the book about the Nordic breakaway civilization. We'll come back to that. The fourth uh, considers uh, the matrix machinations uh, as a title, uh, I think, for dealing with uh, the philosophy of perception issue that's at stake here. And uh, the fifth uh, is probably uh, the furthest, uh, the most uh, tricky part of the book. It uh, reaches all the way to Atlantis from there to Mars and to the moon. And the sixth, uh, I think, is the, the heavyweight chapter in the book. It is uh, shining stupidity. It's, it deals with the issue of religions, uh, more than mass religions as they still exist on this earth. From the standpoint of uh, the central theme, uh, UFO phenomenon, it actually is a deconstruction of uh, religious beliefs, uh, explanation of them from uh, the, the point of view of uh, UAP disclosure, uh, the real UAP disclosure in this case. So in the seventh chapter is uh, forward looking, um, which is also seen in its uh, very original title. I can't pronounce it correctly, but I think it's something in English like Promethe Aeon. So Prometheus and the word Aeon from Greek. Perhaps you can say something about that last word which you invented. Sorry. Uh, I pronounce it Prometheon. And okay. um, it's a contraction of Prometheus, or rather Promethea, which is the defining quality of Prometheus, and the word Aeon in or eon in greek yes. and you know i get into the different usages of, of this word uh differentiating its usages um to signify a vast epoch of, of cosmological time a kind of cosmological age or eon from its use as an aeon or uh deity um uh let's say spectral force presiding over uh, the spirit of an age. And so uh, in this final chapter, I'm basically uh, engaging in a discussion of a uh, coming eon that will be defined by the spirit of Promethea. Yes, I found this a very uh, interesting uh, entry point, uh, exit point of your book. Um, the word eon, of course, refers to the also to the Gnostic concept uh, of personified time, the time in a personalized form, uh, headed by a god or by a person. And of course, this ties into uh, the figure of Prometheus, which has been uh, a central figure in all your writings, or in most of them. Um, and that's the next question I wanted to ask you. Um, you have published the Prometheus, manifesto uh, you are one of the leaders of the promethean uh, movement uh, founded uh, some years back now um, to what extent is this book that you now wrote uh, closer encounters relevant uh, to the prometheus movement it's extremely relevant so there are three ways that you can look at this book um, and we can get briefly into each of them. Uh, one way you can look at it is as a kind of grand synthesis of various theories uh, interpreting UFO phenomena. Another way that you can look at it is as a philosophical text that explores questions like the nature of creativity, um, what, what the fundamental ontology uh, would have to be structured like for us to have something like free will, and a uh, kind of creativity that we would be personally responsible for. And then a third way that you could look at this book, which is responsive to your question, is that it's a major tactical contribution to Prometheism as a movement. Because what it does is basically it lays out the battlefield and identifies the enemy. Uh, this is uh, the text in which, for the first time, I you know, very clearly uh, delineate the structure of the conflict that we're in and uh, provide a rather rigorous characterization of the, the opposing forces that are at play here. Uh, so, you know, I had 
touched on the subject of the breakaway civilization in my essay, Black Sunrise, which was published in the anthology Lovers of Sophia. And I return to it in this chapter of Prometheism titled Atlas Never Shrugs. But um, the subject of the uh, breakaway civilization is laid out in much more depth and detail in Closer Encounters. And it's, uh, it's also connected very explicitly to um, the Promethean ethos that I elaborated, you know, uh, you know in, in the context of launching the Prometheus movement in the book Prometheism. So uh, by the end of Closer Encounters, you know, after this book length chapter six, that is a deconstruction of the Abrahamic religions. Uh, and then after this uh, discussion of, you know, the character of the uh, Prometheon or the Eon of Promethea, you get a real sense of what we're up against, you know, what the, um, the enemy of Prometheism really is and how long the struggle has been going on. And, and also uh, the fact that the duration of this struggle cannot be strictly conceived in terms of chronological time. It is, uh, in fact, a hyperdimensional struggle. And it forces us to uh, reconsider some of our most basic notions about the ontology of space and time. So, you know, in short, that's, uh, that's uh, my response to that, is that it's a major tactical contribution to Prometheism. And one that I think I could not have offered but for the level of uh, governmental disclosure that's taken place now on the subject of UFOs. I think that this book um, would have been even more difficult for people to digest had it come out even two or three years ago than under the present conditions. And let me give you an example of that. Uh, about two months ago, I think, yeah, in October, there was another disclosure from the government uh, that came on the heels of this you know, June 2000 and um, June 2021 uh, UAP disclosure. And it was a much quieter admission from the government, but it is even more startling than what they came forth with in that preliminary assessment from the Pentagon. In particular, it's written by two of the uh, scientists that were sent by the Pentagon to study the phenomena at Skinwalker Ranch. It's called Skinwalker at the Pentagon. And it's a kind of follow-up to that infamous uh, Skinwalker book, which I cite quite extensively in Closer Encounters. And in this text, the two scientists uh, describe an array of paranormal phenomena that were connected with UFO sightings uh, and that were experienced by not just every member of the scientific team that was sent by the US government to study the ranch, but also every uh, individual involved in the security personnel at Skinwalker Ranch. And the focus of the book is something known as the hitchhiker phenomenon, where basically everyone who um, you know, was uh, you know, on contract carrying out scientific studies of the various manifestations on this property wound up taking something home with them. So, you know, when they returned home from the Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, they were subject to a plethora of uh, poltergeist phenomena, apparitions, uh, UFO sightings, everything ranging from large, apparently structured craft to small orbs that would uh, float around inside their homes or that would attack their cars in some cases. And the thing about this account is that every page of this book was approved for publication by the Pentagon. Okay, it says this in the foreword of the book, and it was covered in a, in a variety of news stories about the release of this book. So the book declassifies a large amount of information going back even before ATIP uh, to a program known as OSAP that was developed in coordination with, uh, in collaboration with Bob Bigelow. And this OSAP program that preceded ATIP studied you know, all of these paranormal phenomena taking place on the ranch. And the most disturbing thing about this book, which again, I'm using as an example to say, look, the ideas in closer, closer encounters that would have been considered way off the deep end a few years ago are now actually being voiced by government contractors, okay? People with uh, you know, PhDs in various scientific fields. So the most disturbing thing about this book 
which connects, by the way, to what you were saying about the coronavirus and the timing of this disclosure, is that the analysts here, uh, you know, again, working on contract for the Defense Intelligence Agency, developed an epidemiological model for the spread of the experience of paranormal phenomena connected to close encounters at the Skinwalker Ranch. What they noticed was that if someone brought a quote unquote hitchhiker home with them, the person's wife, their spouse or whatever, or the children of whatever government contractor who was working at the ranch would experience paranormal phenomena in their home or you know, uh, in somewhere in their environs, even if the person who had gone to the ranch was not present. And then much more disturbingly, let's say the schoolmates of the children who, uh, you know, uh, whose, whose father worked at the ranch would begin to experience these phenomena. So, you know, the, let's say the best friends of, uh, you know, such and such a contract, the, the best friends of the son of such and such a contractor would start to have these things occur to them in their home or their backyard without the child of the contractor even being present. And, uh, or let's say, uh, there was one case where a contractor who worked at Skinwalker Ranch uh, came back to his office where he had an office mate. Uh, and this office mate's brother, this woman who was his office mate, she didn't experience anything unusual, but her brother started to experience paranormal phenomena that uh, had been completely alien to his, 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 you know, his uh, life prior to that. Immediately after this guy, you know, came back from Skinwalker Ranch. So basically they mapped this out in the way that they map out the spread of viruses. And they found out that if you have had direct experience at Skinwalker Ranch and then you come back home, uh, at least two other people are going to, in your environs or who are connected to you, are going to start having these experiences. And then once each of these people has those experiences, two other people connected to that person are gonna have these experiences. So and they an found R that basically- An, an R not of two, right? Sorry, let me correct myself. I'm sorry. Uh, say that again. An R not of two. I, I repeat that. Well, they say that there's a- uh, Yeah, I wanted to correct myself. It was, yeah. actually, it was actually three. Um, and so the, the uh, what do they call it? It's the R sub number, the, uh, you know, the rate at which a virus spreads. Right. It's, uh, Two for coronavirus, um, the worst strains of coronavirus, last that I checked, and it's three for the spread of these kinds of paranormal phenomena. So, so okay, I mean, this is bizarre. I mean, this is insane, all right? And this is now admitted by the Pentagon. This is an officially declassified document, this book. Uh, so as of October of 2021, we've got the United States government, albeit rather quietly, coming out and saying that UFOs are connected to a plethora of other paranormal phenomena. And moreover, folks, this experience is contagious. So if you become an experiencer, you are going to pass on this experience to other people. And the uh, connection to epidemiology is not merely an analogy, because as it turns out, let's say the people who experience these little blue orbs that seem like they're filled with some kind of electric liquid, if these orbs get very close to somebody or pass through their body, these people almost inevitably come down with some form of thyroid disorder or lethal cancer. So it's a it potentially deadly uh, phenomenon and it's transmissible the way that a disease is. When you start to think of this phenomena in that context, uh, some of the secrecy that's uh, prevailed for the last seven decades um, begins to make sense. Yes, I think it's important here I uh, say something uh, to the audience because uh, you were saying about you're uh, using the words of the deep end. So some of the subjects that uh, are being touched upon in um, closer encounters are uh, what we would have called some years ago of the deep end. Uh, I concur with that. It's important for our listeners because uh, most of them tend to be people that are interested in things dissident rightist or a new rightist. 
um, for worse or for better, both of us have been associated with that uh, movement, uh, but it's very important to uh, pick that apart, to pick apart the elements of that movement that are relevant um, to the narrative uh, of uh, closure encounters. The first would be uh, the traditionalist look at these pheno phenomena. So traditionalism, as it also has gone into the dissident right, has always taken very serious um, extraordinary phenomenon in the Fortean uh, uh, corner. So let's say the, the, the unusual pheno phenomena that are uh, that were listed by Charles Fort in his uh, work. And uh, these have been studied uh, extensively by uh, traditionalist writers. Two points uh, that immediately come to mind are uh, the uh, respect for paranormal uh, abilities. Uh, traditionalists have approached that with an open mind, uh, going back to uh, old uh, traditions to um, uh, see what uh, their moral equivalences uh, would be like. And the second that comes to mind is the concept of uh, specialized and sacred spaces on earth, right? That's also something that's very present in uh, traditionalist thinking. And uh, Dr. Giorgiani's work has uh, touched upon both, of course, paranormal abilities, uh, telekinesis, uh, psychokinesis, uh, for example, telepathy, and uh, also the concept of specialized sacred spaces, which, of course, Dr. Giordani uh, uh, specifies as being portals rather than sacred spaces per se. Um, so this is uh, one angle. A second angle in the dissident right movement uh, to look at these issues would be uh, in an alt-right mode. So the interest in the Third Reich and the esoteric Hitlerism that has come out from that. Uh, these topics are also uh, being touched upon uh, by Dr. George Ali in a very original manner. Um, the putative uh, Nazi survival uh, that esotericists have been indulging in since the Second World War. So survival of uh, Nazi leaders, uh, but also of uh, hidden Nazi knowledge and even uh, uh, hidden Nazi colonies, for example, in Antarctica. These things, they have been speculated a lot uh, in alt rightist circles. But they are also relevant in a specialized way to the topic at hand now. And um, there is a third way uh, in which uh, the new right or the distant right has been interested in these phenomena, and it is Archeo Futurism. So there has been this school of thought developed by Guillaume Fe that has also has a very had a very respectful uh, attitude towards uh, the investigation of paranormal phenomena and including the UFO phenomena. It's very important to get these things right, that people um, get out of their uh, comfort zone with regard to what is uh, normal and not normal. We are not only living in very special times, um, there are also very special uh, portals opening up uh, through uh, such things as the putative UAP um, disclosure taking place from uh, official official dom itself. So that is something I wanted to add for the public. Um, another question that I have is, um, I should a little bit elaborate. Um, one of the key theses of the book is that, uh, assumptions of your book is that um, the techno singularity um, is the vital uh, ingredient of the breakaway uh, uh, civilization. So techno singularity, uh, that could be an AI uh, development, it could be a gene uh, bio, uh, bio evolutionary strategy through genetic research, but more importantly, zero point energy. That's what you have been pointing to. That has, that's the key element of this, uh, uh, this, this singularity. My question to you would be, um, when do you think uh, did the most essential uh, phase take place? Because you're talking about as a pro as a project, as a promoted process, in fact, that, that singularity. But what what do you think are the key uh, moments in that process that we can identify so far? Okay. So again, the devil's in the details. So people should read the book, or rather, you know, now there's an audio book version out, and uh, so you know people can listen to it. Um, so what I'm going to lay out here will be, you know, in, in summary fashion, 
uh, and there's a lot of supporting uh, citations in the text itself um, uh, that I would refer people back to. I would say that the key phase involving zero point energy and the manipulation of space time was somewhere between uh, 1940 and 1955 or so. But that comes at the end of a very long developmental trajectory that goes, uh, that reaches back to the late 19th century. Um, essentially in this book, my thesis is that, well, I mean, there are a number of theses, but the thesis most relevant to what you just laid out in terms of uh, the various angles from which this book is of interest to the intellectual right, let's say, intellectual right wing, uh, is that, think about it this way. If the thesis of the technological singularity is legitimate at all, then, uh, and then granted, you know, we have different cultures and different nations on this earth and they have varying levels of technical development, okay? Varying rates of uh, technological progress then it is the case that there are going to be a group of people in a particular nation who achieve a singularity level technology before anyone else does in a particular nation, or you could say a particular civilization, the elite of a particular civilization. Well, uh, it's assumed by most transhumanists today that we are about, oh, 20, 30 years away from the technological singularity that it will take place around about the year 2050. At one point in the past, they thought it would be the year 2030. They re revised their estimates. But their estimates are based on a uh, mechanistic relativistic physics model that became entrenched in the early 20th century. And one of the things that I argue in this book is that that physics model was uh, basically promulgated at the top academic research institutions and, uh, you know, scientific laboratories in a very duplicitous way by elites who had an alternative physics model that they secreted away for the sake of their own private development. And this alternative physics model, which acknowledges the existence of a dynamic ether, is the physics model that, say, Nikola Tesla was working with when he uh, developed his plans for a world wireless transmission of energy. It's a physics model that dates back to the late 1800s. And so I contend that uh, people working with this physics model achieved zero point energy after a long developmental trajectory by the 1940s. And then in the 1950s, they operationally began to manipulate space-time. And if we want to identify who these people would have been, right, who, who would have had the technical capabilities and the scientific sophistication between, say, 1890 and 1950 to achieve this kind of technology? Well, clearly, it would have to have been the Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Germanic peoples. If you look at the relative levels of scientific development in different cultures on the Earth, within that time frame, And then when you look more closely at the nexus of scientists, uh, financiers, and um, political leaders stretching from America through Britain to Germany from about 1890 to uh, the Second World War, you see that there is a very clearly defined network that connects people like the eugenicists in Britain to bankers like JP Morgan in America and New York to uh, the funders of Italian fascism and national socialism in Germany. You have a network of physicists who are all on the same page. You have uh, the commonality of the belief in eugenics and extremely aggressive state-sponsored eugenics programs, both in Britain and especially in the United States of America, which then became the model for the eugenics programs in Germany. So you have a, a Nordic elite, basically, a group of Anglo-Saxons who uh, subscribe to the idea of the Nordics as a master race and who are 
committed to large scale eugenics programs, okay, to uh, enhance, you know, the attributes that they consider definitive for their population group. And the same elite is also uh, working on advanced propulsion projects. In particular, I identify a project that was industrially based in the United States, but that was being uh, funded and directed from Prussia uh, in the 1890s through uh, the early 1900s to develop airships yeah. based on uh, the same type of uh, energy technology that Nikola Tesla was working with. So if, if you look at Tesla's drafts for his world wireless system, you'll notice that there are these wingless airships in the uh, technical drafts for the, you know, Wardenclyffe Tower and so on and so forth. And these are not Zeppelins, okay? They're not gas-based airships. These are basically what today we call uh, cylindrical or cigar-shaped UFOs. And, you know, these uh, craft were seen en masse over American cities in the 1890s, particularly from 1896 to 1897. And a lot of people, uh, including some very respectable members of, of their communities, sheriffs, judges, you know, and so forth, uh, interacted with the pilots of these airships when they would come land in fields like, you know, I don't know, in Kansas and Texas and so forth to resupply. And the people in these airships told them that they were being funded by financiers in New York. And when you delve into this, uh, this airship mystery of the late 1890s, you, you see that actually the people who were uh, sending the technical teams over here to develop these airships in America were a group of uh, Prussian nationalists. Now, this was at a time uh, you know, before we had a unified German Reich. And so there were people in the 1890s that had the aspiration to unify all Germanic territories and then colonize America for its extensive resources, both of the Americas, both North and South America. And these people sent technical teams over here, funded from New York, funded uh, probably by JP Morgan, the same person who was a uh, principal uh, you know, financier together with Rockefeller and uh, Dulles, who later became the director of the CIA, Morgan, uh, who was a principal financier as well of the Nazi party and of Italian fascism. So he was funding this airship development program from New York. Um, and uh, I think this is the starting point for the technical trajectory that eventually leads to um, the uh, Kamler Stab, the Kamler staff based in Nazi occupied Prague, where the final breakthrough uh, into zero point energy was made, where they developed this, you know, bell shaped device that had counter rotating cylinders full of uh, mercury thorium isotope, uh, and that was, you know, uh, shocked with, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, alternating current energy. And, uh, you know, this uh, device basically had uh, anti gravitational properties and resulted in a local distortion of space-time. So you have this long developmental trajectory from the 1890s airships to the uh, Die Glocke or the bell that was developed in Prague. Uh, but my argument in this book is that it's a fallacy to characterize this as some kind of Nazi development of anti-gravity technology. Rather, Nazi Germany itself needs to be understood as a kind of field laboratory, a kind of Frankenstein's laboratory set up by a vast uh, Anglo-American, Anglo-Saxon elite, and then harvested post-1945, where then you know, projects continued in other places um, as this ZPE technology became operational, as it was installed inside saucer airframes and so forth. So that's, uh, you know, in broad brushstroke, the kind of developmental trajectory that took place. And again, I'll underline, you know, what I stated at the outset, the people who were involved in this project were also ardent eugenicists. And I think that their eugenics programs also continued in secret post-1945. Uh, and the third element, which I, I neglected to mention, was that all of these people were also deeply into the occult. So you see, you know, that uh, many of these same elites 
um, in America, in Britain, and of course in Germany, where the Thule Gesellschaft and the Vril Society were set up, were occultists as well. The Vril Society, uh, which spawned the National Socialist German Workers' Party as its political action committee to fight communism in the streets of Germany in the 1920s, that uh, Vril Society was based on ideas set forth by uh, Edward Bulwer Lytton, a British aristocrat, as early as the 1870s. So Bulwer, Bulwer Lytton is, you know, writing about Vril, the quote unquote power of the coming race in the 1870s in Britain. And then, you know, in uh, the 19 teens in Germany, you have the secret society, which then spawns the Nazi party as its political action wing. So there, there's this whole nexus of connections between, you know, eugenicists, occultists, scientists working with an alternative uh, ether based paradigm. And between 1890 and 1950, uh, I proposed that these people developed a breakaway civilization, which then began to operate hyperdimensionally, at which point then we're dealing with the entire scope of human history that's being manipulated by this elite. Yes, um, you did point in your book to three mechanisms, three uh, key uh, concepts that uh, operate continuously uh, out of this Nordic breakaway civilization and its predecessor. So uh, the concept of, uh, in German, the Weltanschauungskrieg, worldview warfare, you translated quite correctly, um, which is, uh, which implies uh, Psyops on a global scale. The second um, element is the upbow strategy, so the strategy of deconstructing, um, yeah, anachronistic or enemy uh, social economic constructs, um, as well as uh, cultural uh, and religious uh, construct, uh, concepts. And then, of course, the central concept of the thousand-year Reich. So. I think you pointed quite uh, accurately to that last term as um, not implying any duration, but rather an eternal order that should be of a static nature. So that is the aim of that breakaway uh, Nordic uh, group. Um, an ideal state, let's say, um, uh, of course, uh, founded on the principles of the original uh, people who achieved uh, the singularity, let's say, um, which also would explain uh, the, ju the eugenic uh, drift that you point to. Um, you, you talk, for example, about George Adamski, who was famous in the 50s, who was received, by the way, uh, by the uh, four last queen uh, of my country, Holland. Uh, queen Juliana received this uh, gentleman in her palace because he found his thesis so interesting. This man, he stated that he was like abducted or in contact with uh, what you would call Nordic looking aliens. So um, this is an uh, old theme that uh, you reinsert in your, uh, in your book, which is now becoming again, um, uh, quite uh, actual, quite uh, important for current affairs. Um, what I would like to ask you uh, concerning the uh, Weltanschauungskrieg, so the worldview warfare, you point to various uh, examples of it. One of the most famous ones being the Roswell uh, incident and uh, the UFO scare over Washington just after uh, the Second World War. You point to this as um, examples of uh, attempts or partial successful uh, elements of world fuel, fuel warfare. Um, but you also point to the longer duration uh, world fuel warfare. Um, and you state that these are, uh, this world fuel warfare strategy is also applied to religions. So this uh, breakaway civilization has been able to project backward in your, in your view, um, its values. Uh, to project them and uh, to create a world religious state of affairs uh, that serves their interest. Um, if I can uh, term it in my own words, it, it, it looks like you are presuming a kind of a collective Stockholm syndrome, right? Uh, taking hostages, whole populations who are, uh, who believe in a certain thought system that serves a certain purpose 
um, uh, the purpose of the breakaway elite. Can you expand a little bit uh, on that uh, theme? Because it, it applies not only to the Abrahamic religion, but even in a certain sense to what are ideally speaking uh, philosophical systems like Buddhism. Okay, so there's a lot there. Um, on the way to answering the central question that you, you ended with, let me just say first a few words about Adamski and company. Uh, George Adamski, George Van Tassel, and George Hunt Williamson, it's funny they're all named George, yes. are three of the 1950s contactees who all claimed that they were visited by these Nordic looking aliens uh, who claim to be from various places, including Venus. Um, and when you look into the biography and the actual teachings expounded in the speeches delivered by these people, you find that, well, frankly, they are rabidly racist uh, believers in fascism. Okay, yes. uh, George Hunt Williamson, whose real name was Michel Dobranovich, was actually the editor for a magazine uh, put out by William uh, Dudley Pelley's group, the Silver Shirts, who are basically American Nazis operating in the 1930s. Um, George Van Tassel lived in a, an underground uh, subterranean rock structure that was a hideaway of a uh, Nazi uh, operative in the United States who was actually blown up by federal forces inside that structure. He, his, his guts were blown across the walls and Van Tassel was living in a house splattered with this guy's blood, which I think that he, he saw as a kind of like sacred, you know, environment, okay, where he moved his wife and his children uh, and where he used to be visited by uh, none other than, than Howard Hughes, who would land his private jet there and have dinner with them. Uh, and then, of course, Adamski, you know, was surveilled by the FBI for, for many years. And uh, they, they concluded that on the face of it, you know, some of the things he said seemed to sound communist, but when they dug a little deeper, they saw that basically um, Adamski was, was uh, espousing a fascist ideology and he left various hints in his writings uh, about advanced propulsion technology developed in Nazi Germany. So these three people all have extensive fascist connections. Uh, that's a surface level of Weltanschauungs Krieg. When you go back through history, I think you see one of the operative principles of uh, what I call deconstructive departure, destructive departure and worldview warfare in terms of the opposition between traditionalist paganism and the Abrahamic revelations. So this is a huge controversy that you know, um, is raging on the right wing now between people who want to go back to some kind of traditionalist paganism who, you know, I don't know, believe in Zeus or Apollo or, you know, whatever paternalistic uh, paganism, maybe they're uh, Hindus who, uh, you know, identify with the Vedas and they have some kind of a neo-Vedic worldview on the one hand versus people who are defenders of Christianity on the other hand and see kind of medieval European feudalism as their ideal. And what I suggest in this, there are even some who defend Islam and think that there, there are things about Islam that ought to be you know, imported uh, into the West or, or adopted um, you know, by traditionalists in the West. In any case, uh, I think that this binary was deliberately set up by the breakaway civilization, operating hyperdimensionally, you know, shaping the whole span of uh, recorded human history. They set up this false polarity between the paternalistic forms of paganism that we had in classical antiquity and that continue in India on the one hand, and then these Abrahamic revelations on the other hand for which they are also responsible. So one of the operative principles of Deltan Shang's Krieg is to set up a false binary, okay? To put people within a double bind where they're presented with two alternatives that appear to be in conflict with one another, but these are false alternatives that have been set up for them in order to trap them in a kind of situation where they can be more easily manipulated and directed towards some occulted goal or aim, okay? That, that has been determined by the masters of psychological warfare and of social engineering. 
So I go through uh, the Bible, uh, both Old Testament and the New Testament, you know, and, and the, you know, gospel of Jesus. And I identify all of these incidents, uh, you know, from uh, Moses and the Exodus on to, you know, what, what Ezekiel describes having taken place in ancient Babylon. There's, I, I don't know, something like well, more than a dozen UFO encounters described in the book of Ezekiel alone, uh, which he experienced uh, in his lifetime in ancient Babylon. And uh, all the way up to the mission of Jesus, where, I mean, Jesus basically, I mean, rides around in UFOs and has interactions with them on a regular basis. Uh, for example, the baptism scene in the Jordan, the thing that, that flies over and lifts him up into itself and takes him to the desert to quote unquote be tested by the devil that thing is not a dove in the text it says and it flew like unto a dove meaning a fixed wing aircraft doves don't flap their wings when they soar and so this thing that took jesus up into itself it levitated him from out of the waters of the jordan and brought it up uh, brought him up into itself this thing was a fixed wing aircraft and it flew him out into the desert and then, for example, in the transfiguration scene, quote unquote, transfiguration scene, uh, it's called that because there's this bright light radiating from behind Jesus. And the light is produced by an object that's on this hill uh, and which has Moses and Elijah in it. The disciples say that Moses and Elijah came from out of this luminescent object. Uh, and, you know, basically Jesus introduced them to these preceding prophets as a way to legitimize his authority. So, and then, you know, uh, just to give one final example, uh, and there are many others, um, at the so-called resurrection, when Jesus is, uh, okay, so, you know, he's in this tomb, which then, you know, Mary comes and finds the tomb empty, and there's this mysterious, uh, handsome, presumably Nordic looking youth sitting there at the, at the empty tomb and tells Mary that, you know, he's already ascended. Well, there are two of these, uh, you know, young handsome people who come to the tomb and are witnessed by centurions who are terrified and they use, I don't know, psychokinesis or some kind of other remote influence to roll the rock to the side and enter the tomb, uh, lift Jesus up out of the crypt uh, and he's being carried by them, you know, one arm around each of their shoulders uh, on the way to being lifted up again by one of these, you know, vehicles uh, uh, in his so-called ascension. So the resurrection also involves these mysterious strangers, which, you know, are referred to uh, as Elohim um, uh, in the Old Testament, the gods, uh, or as angels uh, or messengers, quote unquote, in the New Testament. And so, yeah, I go through the the you know, a biblical scripture. Um, and I believe this is true of the Quran as well, although I don't spend as much time on the Quran because I've written about it extensively in other contexts, that the Abrahamic so-called revelations uh, were revealed by what we today would call UFO pilots, uh, UFOnauts, and that it was a machination devised by the breakaway civilization uh, to trap the population of this planet in a false alternative between uh, paganism and a new revelation, an iconoclastic revelation that is as paternalistic as traditional forms of paganism. So you'll notice if you look at that belief structure that Prometheus is an outlier, that Prometheus is a pagan figure which was already in a rebellion against the classical pagan pantheon, and is a figure who, in an Abrahamic context, winds up being defined as Lucifer or Satan. So, you know, you can see here that uh, this fits into the context of my Prometheism project, insofar as it's tracing the genealogy uh, or genesis of this conflict between uh, God on the one hand, and then the Promethean or Luciferian forces uh, on the other hand. And so I would say that, you know, the, the controversy that rages uh, on the right wing today between paternalistic paganism and paternalistic Abrahamic revelation is a false alternative. And the real alternative uh, is, you know, the Promethean 
versus belief in uh, gods of any kind who are overlords um, on this planet. Yes, um, I do think that's true. Um, your program, the Prometheus program, I would call uh, very progressively humanist, or rather futurist humanist, right? It's a defense, defense of uh, humanist values against intrusions and manipulations of any kind. It's very admirable, I think. Um, what I uh, found very intriguing in the introduction to your book um, is a sentence that I came across that reads as follows. Almost nobody is ready for open contacts with aliens. Um, what struck me in this is the word almost. So you don't say nobody is uh, ready for open contact with aliens, you say almost nobody. Can you specify and talk about that a little? Certainly. Um... Uh, let me just, uh, and I, I will not forget your question, but let me just back up for one minute and add something to my uh, previous response because you, you, know, you brought up uh, defense of humanism against um, uh, traditionalist uh, values. Uh, and then earlier you were talking about archaeofuturism and where it fits on the spectrum of right-wing uh, yes. ideologies. So let me just add one thing to my previous response, which is that one very significant point that I make in this book and it's something that I've touched on in previous writings, is that fascism is not an ideologically coherent phenomenon. There were two uh, radically opposed tendencies within fascism. One was traditionalist and the other was futurist. Yes. And in the 19 teens and 1920s, there was a marriage of convenience between these two forces, between the forces of, let's say, the Hitlerists on the one side, uh, or you know the you know yeah let's say let's say the Hitlerists on the one side and the people who were epitomized by uh, the leadership of Marinetti on the other side and of course if we're talking about avant-garde cutting-edge technological development and scientific research the futurists involved in the so-called fascist movement are going to have at least uh, as much control. Uh, and influence, if not more, than the traditionalists. So what I hypothesize, and this is a very bold uh, speculation, I, I'm aware, but it's based on an interpretation of a lot of different kinds of empirical evidence. What I hypothesize is that the breakaway civilization was co-developed by the futurists and the traditionalists working together as they were in the lead up to the Second World War. And that once this breakaway civilization became hyperdimensional and started to manipulate the variables of human history, okay, and then consequently shape the history that has come down to us as ours, the history that we remember, once they started to operate on that hyperdimensional level and let's say spawned this civilization in vast antiquity on Mars, these two factions turned on one another and their marriage of convenience fell apart. There was a divorce and uh, ultimately an open conflict between these two groups. And so I, I suspect that the traditionalists in this fascist breakaway civilization became the Olympian gods or the Hindu devas. And the futurists are the ones who we think of as the Titans, the Promethean or Luciferian rebels against the uh, Olympian order. Uh, the people who were responsible for the rebellion of Atlantis against Olympus, which ended in the destruction of this worldwide civilization that was very cosmopolitan and uh, futurist and ultimately humanist, as you put it. Um, so, so this is a basic structure in my text, this dichotomy between futurism and traditionalism within so-called fascism itself. And this is an interpretive matrix for understanding, uh, you know, the mythological idea of the conflict between the gods and the titans. Okay, so that having been said, let me address this question of yours about almost no one. Uh, one of the ways in which this is a rather grim text um, is that I really make it very clear how much will be demanded of society by full disclosure. And so here we have to grapple with the fact that 
as Adamski, George Hunt Williamson, George Van Tassel, and all these contactees have made clear to us, the beings who pilot UFOs are tremendously telepathic and telekinetic. They have extraordinarily adept psychic abilities. So if our society were to be integrated into theirs, or they were to become the governors of our society uh, and relocate their population openly to the surface of the earth, we would be living in a world where there's mainstream scientific recognition of psychic phenomena. And immediately attendant to that, there would be widely available protocols and programs for the cultivation of these latent human abilities. Okay? And as I already suggested, beginning with Prometheus and Atlas, uh, you know, that's the end of personal privacy. You know, anyone can use clairvoyance to see anything that you're doing in what you had considered to be your most private spaces. By the way, that also would end any notion of state secrecy. Um, even your thoughts are not immune to telepathic surveillance by one or a, a group of people who want to uh, come to know you better than you may even know yourself. And then the telekinetic possibilities are truly terrifying um, because, you know, these new agers, they love to, they love to talk about distant mental influence used for healing or psychic healing. You know how it's possible to use telekinesis to, uh, well, you know, heal somebody's cancer or, um, you know, uh, basically, uh, you know, promote immune system strength or address any number of other ailments. But obviously, as the Soviet Union, you know, demonstrated very clearly in its psychotronic research in the 1970s, you can use the same abilities to stop somebody's heart or give them a stroke remotely. Well, how are we going to deal with that from a legal and political perspective? I mean, last time we had a legal system that acknowledged psychokinesis, people were burned at the stake for being sorceresses or sorcerers or witches. I mean, we did have a legal system that acknowledged telekinesis, but it was in the context of medieval theology. And, you know, people were burned at the stake or suffered mob justice in places like Salem in, you know, America. Uh, how are we not going to have that whole scenario play out again when somebody comes into a court of law and says, you know what, uh, I know that my neighbor who, you know, is on record being an adept telekinetic uh, messed with the electrical wiring in my house remotely and, you know, burn my house down with my two children in it. Uh, how, how is the legal system going to deal with a case like that? Uh, what does intellectual property mean in a world where it's possible for, you know, people in one corporation to use precognitive clairvoyance to surveil the future design specifications that will be develop, developed by scientists working at a rival corporation, you know, five years into the future or 10 years into the future? Our entire legal and political framework would have to be restructured. I think you're pointing very correctly to the uh, human impact, the impact on uh, human, humanity as we uh, experience it now. Um, one thing uh, that you also do in your book is pay attention a lot to victims uh, of abductions, um, manipulations and uh, mutilations. Um, personal witness uh, accounts of these are, uh, in your own words, you included them in, uh, in your book. Um, I would like to quote uh, something from a famous, uh, what you would call a UFO experience in modern art. So it was a song that was published in 2006 um, about somebody's experience uh, in this field, personal experience. And it's quite enigmatic, uh, but I would like to share it because it shows that uh, this experience is uh, uh, in the public domain. There are many of these experiences now influencing people to such an extent that they are affecting mainstream culture. So this is a song that talks about a, a girl's experience, a girl's experience uh, about being in love with somebody and not doing very well. But then there is a very en enigmatic uh, part to the, to the song. I just read the text. She had disappeared long ago, waiting for Arthur to come through her window. So Arthur, that's a person that she loves and she would like to salvage her from her current predicament. Then another voice says, here I am, my love. But nobody came and the mist fell down. My friends transformed into cane toads, sitting in a row, blowing on cigars. And Arthur was replaced by a spacecraft. 
then a chorus sets in which says you want the kiss of life and open up your heart then step inside and you will be all right and then again the text continues and she can see a life by the shore it calls her name it's pure in love and true and she runs towards his unbelievable love a child she's dreaming of and then the chorus my child i am you i am so this is from a song of 2006 it's in the public domain um, by a quite famous singer um, this clearly refers to a phenomenon uh, experience uh, also covered in your book but of a very positive uh, in a very positive experience very positive way um, and my question attached to it is the following. You distinguish between uh, two kinds of interferences. The interferences from this northern breakaway civilization and uh, another group of uh, interferences in space-time, uh, disturbance, causing disturbances, intrusions, appearances and disappearances. And you um, refer to the trickster uh, as a putative name, as, a, as an indicator of the origin of this uh, of these phenomena. So there are two dis distinct sets of phenomena that has, they have to be separated from each other. Um, to what extent do you think it's possible that uh, trickster interferences take on a shape comparable uh, to interferences from the Nordic breakaway civilization? So it's interesting that you led into that question by citing a case uh, involving a modern artist because that's actually a subject that I get into um, substantively in this book. Uh, there, there is a, a section in this book where I talk about close encounters with mantids, praying mantis-like beings associated with UFOs in the context of an essay on the praying mantis by the surrealist uh, Roger Calois. And Calois, you know, he knew a lot of the other leading surrealists um, like Andre Breton and, and Max Ernst and so on and so forth, uh, all of whom, by the way, were deeply into the occult. And uh, Calois' essay on the praying mantis is a key, I think, to understanding this other trickster aspect of close encounters that you just mentioned. Uh, there are a variety of uh, apparitions from shape-shifting owls, to praying mantises, to the so-called men in black, who I think when you look carefully at the cases are not government agents, but some kind of uh, class of apparitions, psycho psychokinetic or ectoplasmic apparitions. There are a set of these forms um, that appear to be, let's say tentacles of a spectral trickster, that there is a kind of intelligence capable of mimicking various aspects of close encounters from you know the shapes of flying saucers and you know cylindrical ufos and so forth to the various types of beings that you know uh um people interact with in other words uh that uh you know the the uh, the nordic civil uh, breakaway civilization fields as part of the close encounter phenomenon there's a there's a type of intelligence that is a uh master of mimicry like praying mantises are masters of mimicry uh, that can produce ufo type phenomena in a way that acts as a destructuring force in opposition to the machinations of the breakaway civilization and there there's more than one uh case there's also an, an artist david huggings uh whose paintings i discuss there's more than one case um, it, it, you know, laid out in this book where the machinations of this trickster involve art and creativity. Because I think ultimately the purpose of this intelligence is to break us from out of a fifth dimensional prison that we've been ensconced in by this Nordic breakaway civilization. So, you know, again, if the Nordic breakaway civilization is run by people with a traditionalist ethos, people who have a perennialist mindset, then seeing themselves as Olympian gods, they believe that they've achieved the most perfect form of society. And that, you know, uh, those who rebelled against that society beginning, you know, at least with Atlantis, if not further in the past, um, have deviated from some putatively perfect order, from a, an earthly order that's a microcosm of cosmic order, what in Sanskrit 
is called Rata, right? Cosmic order. And so these gods see themselves as the kind of guardians of cosmic order. Uh, and they intend to reimpose that kind of order on the planet. This is, of course, what the traditionalists see as the coming of the new Satya Yuga, right? A after the end of the Kali Yuga, there's going to be this new golden age, once again, governed by the gods. An idea that we see, you know, uh, all the way back in the writings of Plato uh, in texts like Cratylus and, and um, Critias. So um, this trickster, I think, is aiming to break us from out of uh, this imprisoning ideology of achieving a final and most perfect form of society so that this trickster can reactivate the developmental potentialities intrinsic to humanity and restart human evolution, okay? So that uh, this trickster can inspire us to uh, take an evolutionary leap into uh, another phase of human development or post-human development. And specifically, uh, what I argue in this book, and this is a lot of information, you know, that's, that's extremely contracted in the way I'm about to present it right now, but what I argue in this book is that there are all these UFO bases on the planet, you know, some of them, many of them under sea, after all, 70% of the surface of Earth is covered by oceans. So there are all these UFO bases under the ocean, inside mountains and so forth, um, many of them inside um, national parks where you know, it's reliable that there aren't going to be any urban developments over the long term. And these UFO bases, because they house large numbers of craft that uh, run on zero point energy, which distorts the fabric of space time, these bases produce massive local uh, warping of space-time. There are, there are spatio-temporal vortices that result in anomalies in these areas. So for example, I think the Bermuda Triangle is one of these. Skinwalker Ranch is another one of these. I identify at least, well, actually a little, little over 50 of these in the United States alone, okay? And so what I argue in this book is that Considering the fact that the majority of these bases are in the oceans, about half of UFOs are seen entering and exiting the world's oceans, including these recent encounters of the Nimitz and other US naval vessels. There are spatiotemporal vortices in the oceans like the Bermuda Triangle that open up a tunnel in time going all the way back to prehistoric eras. And in this context, by the way, just as a side note, I deal with cryptid cases. Cases yes. where people encounter yep. prehistoric creatures that ought to be extinct, okay? So there are these tunnels in space-time, mainly in the oceans. And I look at a scientific study of the, uh, of the genetic, uh, genetic constitution and the capabilities of the octopus as an organism uh, where these 30 or so scientists from various leading institutions around the world concluded that the octopus is not consistent with the uh, general level of evolutionary development on the earth um, and must be the product of a more complex biological matrix. Uh, so, so basically, long story short, there's a signature for the level of evolutionary development across the board on the planet. So that even you know the simpler life forms of our epoch are more complex than the uh, than the most complex life forms of the Cambrian period, and working within the context of this model, an analysis of the octopus in terms of its genetic code and its uh, capabilities, such as its um, almost instantaneous shape shifting and, and texture changing, and the way that its neurology is organized and how it has a brain in each of its tentacles and so forth, its perceptual capabilities. Uh, these scientists came to the conclusion that either the octopus is from space, that it came from uh, a more evolved world like perhaps Europa, the moon, you, you know, Europa, uh, and uh, traveled here uh, in the form of frozen eggs inside some comet that entered the Earth's oceans, right? Or they present an alternative possibility, which is that the octopus is from the future evolutionary matrix of the Earth. And this Latter hypothesis, they don't go into it at all because I think it terrifies them as establishment scientists. 
but this is the one that I pick up and I run with in uh, closer encounters where I suggest that, okay, if there are these spatio-temporal anomalies all over the oceans produced by these UFO bases, it is entirely possible that some organisms from Earth's oceans in the distant future have traveled through this time. And that if the octopus is a living example of such an organism that comes from the future, then what else could have come through these portals? Uh, and so the way I conceptualize this trickster is as a kind of super organism from the future. And I go specifically into the psychic abilities of the octopus, which are tremendous. If people have read my former books, uh, like for example, Prometheus and Atlas, you'll see there's a lot of scientific um, uh, evidence, uh, in particular studies that have been uh, collated uh, and, and synthesized by Rupert Sheldrake that shows that animals, horses, et cetera, uh, they, they have much stronger psychic abilities uh, than the ones that have atrophied in human, in, in Homo sapiens. Uh, and it turns out, as I uh, explained in Closer Encounters, that the octopus is the most psychic animal that we know of. Um, and so I hypothesize that it's possible that there is a superorganism that has come from the future oceans of Earth through these portals, which is tremendously psychic, and that Carl Jung was right to think that uh, you know, at least certain aspects of the UFO phenomenon are psychokinetic in nature, that they're like you know, ectoplasmic projections or materializations of the kind produced by you know, late 19th century mediums. Um, and so you know, when we see mantids or shape-shifting owls or these other, uh, these other manifestations associated with UFOs that seem to express the characteristics of the trickster archetype, what we're dealing with are tentacles of this superorganism, which is extending itself out uh, from the ocean depths across the planet in an attempt to free humanity from the hyperdimensional prison that's been created by the Nordic breakaway civilization. What I find very interesting about um, your interpretation of the UFO phenomenon is that it actually matches. That's very remarkable. It matches the interpretation of traditionalist writers. So what you are saying is uh, there are several explanations or interpretations of the UFO, UFO uh, phenomenon, terrestrial, interdimensional, uh, psychic, uh, crypto terrestrial and virtual. Um, and you actually say, you synthesize them. You say, in fact, it's all of them at the same time. And that's exactly what traditionalist writers uh, analyzing various traditions um, in all kinds of studies have also shown that it is, an, it is not one thing and it is not uh, or, but it is and. And that the, what in fact you conclude that the aliens um, as such are rather uh, chrononauts time travelers than space travelers. And I think that's a very um, insightful uh, analysis. Um, another part uh, of uh, another point at which the traditionalist perspective matches yours is uh, the respect and the circumcision, the circumspection with which uh, to treat certain spaces uh, on Earth, right? Uh, traditionalists would call them uh, sacred spaces, um, spaces where um, the space-time fabric is loosened or disturbed, vortices occur. So um, in traditionalist thought, there is the, the idea of the pole and the counter pole, um, which are both portals, uh, which may be used uh, inadvertently or on purpose, but which uh, involve uh, risk, um, a risk factor. So it, I think that's a very, these are very interesting uh, confluence points uh, between the traditionalist perspective from which I've been writing in my books uh, most of the time. In my last book, The Form of Earth, I have also used a quotation from um, uh, Lovecraft because it actually indicates the same. I want to read it here because it's very relevant to what you're saying about places on earth which are dangerous. And he says, Lovecraft says, it is absolutely necessary for the peace and safety of mankind that some of the earth's dark dead corners and unplumbed depths be let alone, lest sleeping abnormalities wake to resurgent life and blasphemously surviving nightmares squirm and splash out 
of their black layers to newer and wider conquests. That's from the Mountains of Madness, of course. Um, I think this, this shows uh, that we are, in fact, entering a very dangerous and very uh, unsettling territory. As you have said in your previous books, a spectral revolution is what necessary. A spectral revolution, meaning a conceptual revolution, and, and another way of looking at the world uh, is necessary to cope with this phenomena. Uh, which brings me back to my last question, uh, perhaps the most important, and that is um, the conclusion that you reach, uh, namely that recorded history is in fact uh, a revisable past. So human uh, history as it is written down is revisable, can be manipulated as if uh, through manipulating an archive function on a computer. That is an analogy which is not entirely correct, but it gives the listener some idea. Um, which I can explain things like the Mandela effect, right, where people seem to remember something, another version of history uh, than happened in actuality. And in this, uh, in this context, you referred to the, I don't know if it's pronounced it correctly, but the Akashic uh, records. So in Hinduism, there is an idea, or at least it's used by theosophy as such, that there exists such a thing as an ether-based register of human history. That can be accessed uh, even also uh, written sources are not available by psychic means and um, i would like to ask you uh, to what extent do you think uh, these akashic records if you call it like that human history um, is being manipulated not has been manipulated that you state but is being manipulated as we speak I think it is being manipulated as we speak. I mean, there's no, look, uh, there's no reason to think that the kind of machinations that I uh, identify and delineate going all the way back through human history somehow have stopped before the present moment. If anything, it's possible that there's more manipulation going on right now than there ever has been in a single contracted uh, span yes. of time because if there's only 20 or 30 years between us and the technological singularity at the present moment, then we're at the 11th hour as far as the uh, breakaway civilization and its adversaries are concerned, right? Um, if this breakaway civilization has as its goal the reestablishment of some kind of a hierarchical caste society or an Olympian world order, Okay, of the kind that the Atlanteans ultimately rebelled against. If that is the goal, then they cannot allow us to achieve the technological singularity. Because shortly after achieving the technological singularity, not only would we have scientific technical parity with them, we would be able to develop military parity with them, right? I mean, scientific technical breakthroughs, as we know from the atomic bomb, are almost immediately translated into military developments. And so they cannot allow us to get on an equal footing with them. Uh, so I suspect, as, as I, you know, suggested in my book, Prometheism, that what we're going to see over the next 20, 20 years or so um, is an attempt to control, demolish advanced industrial civilization on the part of the breakaway civilization. Um, and, you know, one very obvious way in which this is taking place is through the COVID-19 pandemic, which clearly is a bioweapon. Um, and... I don't think it's incidental at all that it came from China, that it came from, you know, the laboratories in Wuhan, because for a variety of reasons that I've explained in my writings, uh, I think the Nordic breakaway civilization has made a deal with the Chinese leadership um, for the Chinese to act as a kind of viceroy uh, or managerial, um, managerial uh, class uh, on behalf of these uh, Olympians. Uh, you know, reasons that have to do with the paternalism and, uh, you know, inherent traditionalism of uh, Confucian um, ideology. And, and so, you know, there are various obvious ways, like the pandemic and the mandatory vaccination uh, policies across the planet, that the breakaway civilization has begun the process of controlled demolishing advanced industrial society. But I think that there are other ways they are probably going about this that are less obvious to us, you know, and that are occulted and probably involve, uh, you know, this hyperdimensional physics. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it stands to reason that 
there's more manipulation of our space time now than probably there has been uh, at any point in our uh, recorded history. Yes, I think uh, the parallel that you give between the experiences of the last 70 years, the abduction uh, records, the implant records, the mutilation records, um, these seem uh, very well fitted to uh, the kind of programs that we are seeing being rolled out right now on a global scale, right? So the, the, the vaccination programs, the control programs, the digitalization programs, uh, there seems to be some um, eerie overlap here. Um, so I agree with you on that. Um, which, 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 Let me uh, give you one example. Yes, yeah, sure. Let me give you one example, which may be of interest you know, to our listeners. And I touched on this in my novel, uh, Faustian Futurist. The, the Mandela effect uh, experience that uh, struck a chord with me more than, than any other, uh, or rather experience says, the, the, the reports of the so-called Mandela effect or people remembering an alternate timeline um, that really stayed with me more than any other report that I heard for reasons having to do with you know, my background and, and my interests, which you know, to some extent you actually share, is one that involves Iran and nuclear weapons. Yes. Apparently, okay, so you know, for the past 20 years, we've been told by the Israelis and by the CIA and so forth, oh, Iran is two years away from developing nuclear weapons. Iran is 18 months away from developing nuclear weapons. It's been an ongoing news story for the past 20 years. And so one interesting example of the Mandela effect is that people who have been listening to these news reports about Iran potentially developing nuclear weapons have had sudden flashback memories to the 1970s when Iran tested nuclear weapons and joined the club of, of nuclear weapon states. This is a recurring Mandela effect phenomenon uh, where people seem to remember watching on the television that the Shah of Iran had declared that Iran successfully tested nuclear weapons and that the Pahlavi regime was you know, uh, a member of the club of, of uh, nuclear armed countries. Okay, well, look, that's relatively recent history, all right? We're right. talking about 1970s. Uh, now, what would have been the consequences of that? They would have been tremendous. And I lay this out in Faustian Futurist. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan was not about Afghanistan. It was, first of all, Afghanistan is a Persian speaking uh, country that was Eastern Iran until about 200 years ago. The Soviets were not in Afghanistan, you know, let, let me just leave it at the, with its mountain culture, uh, you know, for the purposes of adding another SSR to their Central Asian territories. They were using Afghanistan to uh, basically uh, make their way to the oil resources of the Persian Gulf and ultimately foment the communist revolution in Iran. So if the Soviet Union had seized the Persian Gulf oil resources by establishing a Soviet Socialist Republic of Iran or carving Iran up into a series of Soviet Socialist Republics, they would have won the Cold War. There's no question about it. They would have won the Cold War or at the very least they would still be a superpower today, okay? So this would have been of grand uh, historical significance. And the other thing that you have to factor into that, more importantly, is that the Shah of Iran was traumatized by, in his youth, witnessing the occupation of his country by the Russians, by the Russians from the North and the, the uh, you know, allied powers from the South. But the Russians actually stayed there past the end of World War II. And he went you know, to great lengths to try to kick them out of Iranian Azerbaijan. So and he vowed that he would never let that happen again. If Pahlavi Iran had had nuclear weapons in the 1970s, and if a communist revolution had materialized in Iran instead of an Islamic revolution, and for those who are not familiar with it, the armed force behind the Iranian revolution was Marxist uh, Maoist. It was not yes. Islamist. The communists, oddly enough, got behind the Islamists under the leadership of Khomeini. So the muscle of that revolution was actually leftist and potentially allied with the Soviet Union. If the communist revolution had taken place in Iran and Iran had, uh, or, or rather, let's say, uh, if a communist revolution had broken out in Iran and Iran were in danger of being invaded by the Soviet Union or if the Soviet tanks had actually started rolling into the country, it's quite possible the Shah of Iran would have used nuclear weapons against the Soviet Union. That would have been the end of the planet. The Soviets would have seen the Shah as a proxy of the United States. They would have considered an Iranian nuclear strike against the Soviet Union to be an American nuclear strike against the Soviet Union with plausible deniability. And they would have retaliated against the continental United States. 
Okay, and right now cockroaches would be the only thing alive on this planet. So this is a very significant example of potential timeline alteration. What is this version of the 1970s that people seem to remember where the Shah of Iran developed nuclear weapons? And where, where did that timeline end? What trajectory did that put us on that potentially uh, you know, has since been revised? Yes, in fact, you're talking about the script being rewritten in your own lifetime, right? Uh, occur, uh, allowing for certain residual uh, alternative uh, histories to maintain some kind of presence in people's minds. I think this is a very uh, relevant uh, uh, observation at this point, because as you say, it seems like uh, manipulations of various forms are speeding up, are uh, being, being sped up, let's say it like that. Um, I think as far as I'm concerned, it's better to uh, not tire you further with more questions. I would just uh, like to thank our audience uh, for uh, their uh, kind uh, attention to our uh, podcast. I also wish to uh, show uh, how much uh, we are all uh, in, in Arctos happy uh, for your attention. Wishing you a uh, Merry Christmas. I do see that uh, Dr. Giordani has a tree there. Whether it's a Christmas tree or not, I won't uh, reveal. Oh, it's, a, it's a Christmas tree and you know the ornaments on it are uh, as old as I am. Okay. Um, and we can also uh, wish uh, the other fellow travelers uh, of our movement, as I may call it, a happy Yuletide. But I wish to let, remind all of them of uh, the more important fact that lies behind all of these uh, celebrations, namely the very scientifically precise uh, winter solstice. And this uh, celebration is only kept properly in one tradition, namely the Zoroastrian tradition about which, uh, which Dr. Georgiani knows a lot. So I would like to conclude for my science with the uh, Shafe Fele Mubarak, uh, happy uh, Yalda for uh, Iranian uh, viewers, if there are any such. And I give the last words to Dr. Georgiani. There will be many Iranian viewers and uh, Merry Mithras to everyone. Thank you so much, Alexander. It's been a real pleasure. The pleasure was mine. Thank you.